you study a lot of the great revivals of our time, there was always in some manner, some form of intercession going on in the church. Every time. Um, even the big, the big revival at Asbury in Wilmore, Kentucky, which is still going on, there's intercession in that. Um, there, there's still intercession that goes on over more today for that specific thing. Um, and I really believe that that is a fundamental key for the growth of the church, but not growth numerically. I'm not so much concerned about numerical growth, but I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about growth of the people that sit here. Yeah. That's what I, that's really the one thing I care about. And, and I care about the, the growth and the transformation of the community around us. And prayer is basically one of our most powerful weapons. And um, that's actually what I want to talk about today. Um, I've been promising you guys a series on prayer. Um, I think this is very, very important because Jesus said of all, the house of, of God will be known as a house of prayer. But have you ever really been taught how to pray? I mean, has anybody ever been given instruction on this is how you do it? You might have gone through a discipleship class or a Sunday school lesson that, that talked about how to pray, but how long ago was that? Um, have you ever heard a preacher give real world instructions how to pray in a Sunday morning service? Um, I, I, I think we should focus on prayer fairly often in corporate worship because that's kind of what we do, right? Supposed to. That's kind of who we are, right? Pray. Dude, I need y'all to talk back to me today. I've been gone two weeks. Don't get lax on me. I know Zach and Sonny took it easy on you guys. Uh, we got we to talk back. Alright. Um, you know, I've been gone for two weeks. Zach brought the message that Sunday. It's a good message. It's a good encouraging word. It's an inviting word. Then the next Sunday, Sunny came. Sunny buys. Sunny does what Sunny does. Um, that was a, a transformative word as well. It was also an inviting word, not only his message, but the words that he spoke individually. Right? And then the, the baptisms that took place, the baptisms of the Holy Spirit, what took place there. Now, me being gone for a couple of weeks have, and not having the pressure of having to produce a message for those two weeks has given me a chance to take a step back, watch what's going on, Man. and go, okay, Lord, what are you doing? That's what I want to talk about. And it, taught, and it feels exactly like what Roger got in his heart for Tuesdays. Um, and... I just kind of want to go there. It's just going to take probably a few weeks to get through it. Okay? Um, try not to keep you real long today. I know it's Mother's Day. Um, but our scripture is going to be Hebrews chapter 12, 18 through 24. I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. I don't know how far we get it, though. Okay? Earlier this morning, chapter 12, verse 18 through 24. I only got through verse... Um, 20 this morning. So um, we'll, we'll see how far we get. Do you remember what I told you guys a few weeks ago? Actually, I think it might have been the last time I preached you. About a word that God gave me about He wants to take the nursery out of the church and install an armor. Yeah, nice. Remember that? Yes. What does that mean? A nursery is what? Let's just recap real quick. A nursery is what? A nursery is a place where the kids, the immature, come to be entertained. Come, the, the, the nursery is there to make them happy and feel good and to entertain them and to play with shiny little toys. Right? That's what a nursery does. Do you see the correlation? Yes. What 
is an armory? An armory is a room, at least that's what I picture in my mind, a room, it doesn't matter what the size, but a room, and inside of it has weapons and ammunition in which to wage war. Now, I know our normal nature, our normal inclination, our human nature is we want to come to church and the preacher to put on a good message to entertain us and make us laugh and, and Maybe, but challenges may be a little bit, but we, you know, we want to be entertained. And, and then we want the worship music to be really good, and, and so we can get our little Jesus bumps and, and, and feel good and, and just leave the church with an overall good feeling. Right? That's really not the goal of the church. This should be an armor. Where you come to learn how to use the weapons of your warfare. Paul found language for it. He said, for, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal in nature, but are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, right? So, we have weapons, therefore we must be in a war if Paul's talking about warfare. I think sometimes we forget that we were born into a war. Whether you practice or active in the war or not is really irrelevant. You're still in one. And there are different gifts for fighting this war. Some have some gifts, some have another gifts. You know, I know because I know Roger and I know Zach. They have, they have a gift of intercession, a gift of prayer, a gift of prophetic. I know this daddy has a gift of, of prophecy, of words of knowledge. I, I, I know some of them have, some folks have a gift of, of, of music, of, of, of setting an atmosphere for people to come worship. That's a gift too. I, I understand that, that together we have weapons. But no matter what your weapon may be, you must have a good foundation in order to use the weapon. Now, I'm a, you know, I've been in law enforcement a long time, and I've shot a lot of guns. I've been to a lot of uh, gun training, a lot of firearms training. The first thing before they ever teach you to pull the trigger is they teach you how to stand right so you'll have a good balanced foundation from which to shoot any weapon that you have. Those of you that's been in the military, no. Your footwork's got to be right. You've got to have a good foundation in order to shoot your weapon. If you're off balance, you're not going to hit your target. What I want to do today in the next few weeks is try to teach you guys the foundation from which you would walk. Okay. And we got to review for a minute. What is the Greek word for salvation? Sozo. S O Z O. Sozo. What does sozo mean? Sozo means forgiveness of sins. It's translated in the Bible deliverance from demons. It's translated physical healing in your body. Sozo's translated your relationships made whole. Sozo's translated your physical body made whole. It's translated prosperity in your finances. For those of y'all that don't like prosperity gospel, gospel is a gospel of prosperity. Sozo affects every area of life. Name one thing that you can pray for that's not covered by Sozo. Go ahead, I'll wait. <laughs> well, we can pray for others and, and, and you can't give your Sozo away. Hmm. Matthew 10, 8 says, freely you have received, freely give. That means I can appropriate what God's given to me and give it out to others. Yeah. Well, you 
talk about how do you forgive sins? Jesus says if you forgive the sin of those, you their sins will be forgiven. If you retain any sins, uh oh, what are we talking about? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. There's a level of authority that you have that we've never been taught to reach. Amen. We've never been taught to use. And I've been searching this thing out for over a year on how to use this thing. And I'm just now confident and confident enough to be able to talk about it in front of you. But I have been learning this and searching this out because God has told me there is a level of authority that he wants me to walk in that I've never been taught how because it's not taught. And I want us to learn it together and to walk in it. Amen. Amen. That's what that's what all the baptism of the Holy Spirit was about. It is yes. giving you the authority to walk as sons and daughters of God. Yes. Amen. To, to continue my warfare analogy a little bit, I, I was praying about that word about nursery and armory. I said, Lord, what's the end game? What's, what's the end game of what you want to do here? Here's what I believe the Lord told me. Now the Lord tells and uses the language that we know to teach his truth, right? You know, we, we sing songs. Michelle gives us songs to sing sometimes about raising up an army. God's raising up an army. And that's so true. However, in addition to that, God's looking to raise up people who are Special operations soldiers. Not just regular soldiers. And this is only for those who answer the call and make the sacrifice and learn how to use the authority they've been given. Now, in, in a war zone, even, even in, in law enforcement, a, spec, a, a SWAT officer, let's just use a cop for instance, a SWAT officer, he shows up, it doesn't matter if there's even a captain, a lieutenant that's maybe higher above him in rank in a crisis situation. When a SWAT officer shows up, guess what? He's in charge. Why? Because they've had special training. They have special weapons that no one else has learned how to use. And the other officers are looking to him to give a strategy on how to defeat the enemy. Because he's had more training. He's had more training with more weapons than the regular cops know how. Same thing in, a, in, a, in, a, in the military. Special operations soldiers go and lead other armies. You'll, you'll sit a detachment of, of Marine Recon guys or Navy SEALs, and they'll drop one here, one here, one here, and they'll lead foreign armies. One guy will lead a foreign army, train them, and lead them. Why? Because he's had more training. He has special weapons and he knows how to use them. God's looking for a people that will answer that call and say, choose me, Lord. Here I am. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. And receive special training with special weapons so that he can send them out and lead the armies because when they show up on the scene in a crisis or a bad situation, this person shows up on the scene and all the other little soldiers look to him and say, what do we do? I know that you know what to do. I can see it in your eyes. There's something about you. There's something you give off. I, I, I know that you know how to, how to handle this. And you're like, you know what? I've had training in this. You know, I, I, God brought me through this part of my life. That dark, bad time. And see, here's the deal. Here's the deal. You think your parts of your past is what disqualifies you from being in ministry? God says that that part of your past that you think disqualifies you will qualify you for ministry. My part of my past qualifies me from doing ministry. Now, it's only through the grace of God that that can happen. But it happens. I really think that's what God's doing in these days. I think that's what Tuesday night's for. You know what I really, you know what, can I be honest? When Roger told me that, because he told me last week, 
I think it's a great idea. I think it's a wonderful idea. I think it's needed. I think that's from God. But my first reaction was, I don't know if anybody's going to show up to that. And it bothered me for a few days. I was being honest. Bothered me. But you know what? You know what God told me? He said, no, no, no. This is special operations training. And only those that are willing to answer the call will come. And it may be few. But this is special operations training. This isn't for everybody. But it's only those who are willing to be leaders. It's only those who are willing to get extra training and new weapons and special tactics. That's what SWAT stands for, you know. Special weapons and tactics. I, I kind of see this play as so funny because that's what I must be my life for so long. And it's funny that I just feel like God's making this place a SWAT school. <laughs> for you, for, 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 and I, I went to SWAT school with Memphis, but this is going to be a SWAT school. Special weapons and tactics. It's where you come to learn the weapons of your warfare. Yes. You get what I'm saying? Yes. But here's the deal. Here's the foundation. You got to know from what position you're going to fight from. Yes. And there's two positions that you can fight from. Yes. There's only two. There's your position that you have in Christ as a son of God or a daughter of God. A firstborn it's all in the scripture, so don't get nervous. It's all in the scripture. We just may not get to it all today. But a firstborn child with all the rights and benefits of authority. Yes. As part of the ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church, which means not just a uh, not just a, 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 a body of people that's assembled, but in, in, in Greek culture, it's so funny that, that, that God, that Jesus used the word ecclesia. Because we've adopted Ecclesia to mean the church, in Greek language, Ecclesia actually meant those who have been given authority as a governing body to make decisions for the cities. Right. Yes. Do you know that's what Ecclesia meant? So when Jesus was speaking and he was talking about his church, he used the word Ecclesia. And I bet some of them were going, what are you talking about authority? We just think it's a building. Something you sign a card and now, now I'm a member. But it has everything to do with authority and what you've been given to make decisions that affect the world. Amen. That's Ecclesia. That's the church. See, we lose it in context. We think when Jesus said church, he's talking about the building. Or if, we rule, if we're real spiritual, we think he's talking about us. And he is talking about us, but more importantly, he's talking about the authority that Sozo gives us as children of God. Amen. What happens if we pray for that position? That's, that's position number one. That's the, that's the position you've been given as born-again believers. But the issue is, most of the time, we don't pray from our position. We get over here... And we pray from our condition. <laughs> See, we have a position that says we're all of that and a bag of chips. <laughs> but we have a condition that says, are you crazy? <laughs> How many of you guys have ever got to pray, started to pray, And every bad thing you've done in the last two weeks crosses your mind. Amen. Come on. Am I the only one? Do you know what that is? You're trying to approach God through your position because you, most of you have been here long enough to understand who you are in Christ. But what we've not really talked about is how that conflicts with our condition. And so you're supposed to pray from your position. That's the foundation from which to fire your weapon. That's the, that's, the, that's the foundation that can't knock you off balance with the with the feet spread just enough, the knees bent. So even if you get pushed, you're not moving. The, the, the recoil of the gun 
Boom, boom, boom. Come on, guys, I'm preaching. If you could just get, if you could just get this analogy, the recoil of the gun, because it's so powerful, won't knock you off balance and make you fall. Come on, we can get enough gifts in the, in the church and operate in giftings and talents that will puff us up, but if there's no foundation, it will make us fall. You've got to have the right foundation in which to wage war. And the only place you're ever going to find that is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Not in who you are as a, as a person, not in your giftings, not in your talents. It's only who he says you are and you resting in that fact. That's it. It's the only way. But we get messed up and off kilter because we begin to look at our condition. Because our condition don't match up with our position. And the church for so long, because I'm going to tell you, most of you have been taught this way. Churches for so long has only focused on our condition. Oh, they may teach a little bit about position, but they do it from a condescending standpoint, a condemning standpoint that says, this is who you're supposed to be. Boy, buddy, you better buck up. You better do right. And they focus on your condition and browbeat and browbeat and browbeat. And before long, the only thing you can notice is your ability to miss it. So now you're praying prayers like, let, let's, let's say you got a bill and, and you can't pay it. So now you're praying prayers like, Lord, I, I know I did bad last week. And Lord, I know I don't deserve this and I don't deserve your blessings. But Father, if you could just, if you could just give me a blessing, if you could just give me, I need $100 to pay this bill and I don't have it. Lord, I, I'll do anything you want me to do, Lord. And, and, All right. How many of y'all prayed a prayer like that before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's praying from your condition. Yeah. Can I share a story with you? Because of my ignorance on how the uh, conference reimbursement, scholarship reimbursement goes, my, uh, my scholarship reimbursement, which I would call MEF, Ministerial Educational Fund, was very late getting submitted this semester. Um, and actually, I passed the deadline. And it pays half my tuition. My tuition is about $5,800 a semester. And Rosedale stepped up and gave me some money, but I still had that half that had to be paid. Friday was the cutoff date. Friday, if, I, if that money hadn't got there Friday, I would be dropped from all my classes in the fall. And, and wouldn't be able to do anything until I paid that money off. This is a lot of money. I tried my best to get worried about it. I did. I tried. <laughs> get worried about it. I just couldn't get worried about it. And instead of praying, Lord, I just need this. Lord, if you could just do this and thump Larry Hilliard in the head and make him send that check off to Asbury sooner. And, and, and instead of praying like that, I said, you know what, Lord? This ain't even my journey. I'm on. Amen. You opened this door for me to go through this school. And yes, I messed up because I didn't send that one form off like I was supposed to do. So I messed up and this is all my fault. And it was. It's my fault. I messed up. But Lord, you know what? I'm going to plead your grace over this situation. Right. And I know I'm not even worried about it, Lord, because it's already done. No good thing for me is ever going to be withheld, and it's just going to be fun. That's the way I prayed about it. I prayed about it one time. And that was a few weeks ago. Prayed about it one time, and I let it go. Didn't pray about it again. I get an email, 8 o'clock, which is 9 o'clock, one more time. 8 o'clock. Friday morning from my financial counselor, Jenny Newman. She said, hey, I just want to let you know your MEF check was on my desk this morning. You're good to go. Don't worry about it. Yes. Now, I wish he would not cut it so close. <laughs> but he didn't consult me about a timetable. He just said he'd take care of it. And he did. I just wish he had done it a couple weeks ago. Wow. That will make me feel better. But you know what? I tried to get worried about it. He's like, you know what? He just reminded me this ain't even your journey. Yes. Even though I messed up, yes. Yes. it was my fault. He redeemed the situation. Yes. Yes. 
And that's a big deal because the deadline had passed. Yes. That will happen again, but um, it's still. Do you understand the two difference? Yeah. Yeah. Do you understand it? Yeah. All right, I got to read some scripture to make this legal. <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 18. I'm going to read out the Passion Translation. Now, in this scripture, we're going to get into a lot of Greek and a lot of Aramaic. Um, but there's, there's some pretty cool revelations in this. Um, verse 18. As we approach God, we leave the natural realm behind. Now that's the first verse. That's the first part of that verse. Let's just break that down. That may be where we have to stop. But let's break that down. For when we approach God, which is what prayer is, right? We approach God. Hopefully we approach Him from our position. And this, this passage of scripture literally talks about our position in Christ. And we'll get to that. But we leave the natural realm behind. Well, that's that's different. How do I leave the natural realm behind? And listen, I'm not one of the goofy people. All right, that likes to talk about weird stuff. I'm not. But there is a reality that you must grasp. There is a physical, natural realm, and there is a spiritual realm. Realm. And one is just as real as the other. In fact, the spiritual realm is more real than the physical realm because one day the physical realm will pass away and all that will yeah. remain is the spirit realm. We as Christians who want to have a dynamic prayer life must learn to operate in the spiritual realm and leave that natural realm behind in so much as we're talking about approaching God. Amen. And as, in, as we talk about waging warfare, we don't wage war in the natural realm. We do it in the spirit realm. So that tells me right there that as I, it says, as I approach God, I leave the natural realm behind. That automatically, the very first verse tells me, leave your stinking condition at the door and approach him as a spirit as someone who has been born again and made perfect in his image and totally and completely redeemed, approach him from that way. It doesn't matter what you did last week. It doesn't matter what you did 30 seconds ago. Approach him as someone who is perfect by the blood of Jesus Christ. Pastor giving us license to do whatever we want to do. I'm not. What I'm trying to tell you is the more you focus on your condition, the more you're going to miss it. The more you'll focus on your position, the more your condition will line up with your position. Yeah. Right. Come on. See, the church has so long made us focus on our ability to miss it. And the revelation is, and always has been and always will be, keep your eyes on Jesus and what he's done and everything else will begin to line up. You can't transform yourself anyway. I don't care how disciplined you are, you still can't change your heart. I mean, I can I can put a rubber band on my wrist, and every time I go through a drive-thru, even though I'm on this new diet, I don't go through drive-thrus anymore. But even, <laughs> every time I go through a drive-thru and they're slow and get on my nerves, I can pop that rubber band on my wrist to make me behave. But my heart still went. Yeah. So even, I, I, even if I change my behavior, my heart's still rotten. Okay. You get what I'm saying? Okay. Who's the only person that can change a heart? Jesus. Come on. Who? Jesus. Jesus. So then it's not on me anyway, is it? Come on, that's anti religion. <laughs> it's not on me to change anyway, is it? See, y'all just want to get behind that. Right. Uh, we, 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 we like it, but we just don't know. <laughs> Keep preaching. That's, that's too good. I don't know. <laughs> Come on, if it was just up to me, ain't no way I'd make it. My only goal in life is to know that. Everything else will fall in place. Come on, trust me. I was the worst. 
on this wonderful Mother's Day, I posted this on Facebook today. I said, uh, one of the little pictures, I said, thanks for putting up with me through my first awkward 30 years or something like that. My 30-year awkward stage. Yeah. You know, it was really about 33 year awkward stage. It was close enough. Uh, I figured maybe you could give me a pass on my first three years. Yeah. Uh, I was bad, guys. There's no way I could change my heart. There's a, there's a room full of folks, if they're honest, that could say me too. But I spent a year just trying to get to know it. Even while I kept missing it, and doubting his goodness and doubting his faithfulness for a whole year, a little over a year, every time I prayed, I would say something good with my lips, but my heart would betray it and say, you're not who you said you are, and you're not going to rescue me, and you're, and, and you're not going to prove yourself faithful. My heart said that every time. But yet he's full of grace. And he taught me who he was anyway. Amen. And now, well, no, I'm not perfect, but my heart's different. My heart's changed. Was it a... No, nope, it took me, took me some time. Can it happen? I don't have a problem with that. It just didn't happen that way with me. Took a, took, took, took a few months. It's my position. I leave the natural realm behind and approach him from the spirit realm. Now, in this scripture, this, this talks about the, the realm of um, Sinai and the realm of Zion. Now, that's just Old Testament language for the law, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant, grace and mercy. Anywhere in the Bible you read about the, the Mount, <coughs> Mount Sinai, that's the mountain that God gave Moses the law, the Ten Commandments, right? Fear and trembling. If an animal even approached the mountain, they had to kill it. Mount Zion to the Lopsid. That's what this scripture talks about. We're going to get into it. We're going to get into some of the meanings of the Aramaic words. What, what, what do you do today? I'm running out of time, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell a story real quick to close this. What do we do with this? Well, right now, you haven't heard a lot, but right now, here's what I would suggest. Here's the prayer. In your devotions, your new, new room band guys and ladies that are doing the bands, maybe you can read through your material with this focus. Father, teach me who, what my position is and teach me how to let go of my condition. Teach me how to live life from the foundation of who you say I am. Instead of the foundation of who my flesh says I am. Because when you can learn to pray from the foundation of your position, oh man, you won't talk about moving mountains. That's good. You can move mountains. Now, I want to leave you with this story. I had a dream the other night. Does that mean I'm old or young? I, had a dream. Well, I mean, I had a vision. <laughs> 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 Whichever one that makes me young, that's the one I had. For some of you that don't know what I'm talking about, there's a verse that says, uh, For your old men will dream dreams. I'm about to say it, I don't know. And your young men will. I had a vision. Um, <laughs> So I went to dinner, and I went to dinner with Father God. He was sitting at the head of the table, and this table was awesome, and the chairs were awesome. The chairs were big, high back chairs, very ornate, plush, armrests. It was really, really nice, and. The table was just, I don't know what it was made out of. There, there's, there's really nothing I can describe it. But it was really, really long. And there were so many people sitting there. And there was so much food. 
I mean, some of the best food. I mean, it was great. I mean, they had so much banana pudding, it was crazy. <laughs> and it was, it was the best food. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was great. And so I began to start looking for my seat to try to find out where I was supposed to sit. And Jesus grabs me by the arm and says, No, son, you sit by the Father. Wow. You're the first one. You sit here. God's at the end of the table. And I sit here. He said, That's your position. Which is all of our positions. And the food was great. I mean, it was so good. The drink was awesome, had all kind of thing. But then I noticed something on the floor. And there's people on the floor, on their hands and knees. And they're eating the crumbs that fell off the table. And I, for the life of me, I couldn't realize why are people eating crumbs off the floor when there's so much food on the table? And it's like God heard my thought. And, I, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, why are there people on the floor? And he began to cry. And he said, those are my firstborns, too, if they don't know who they are. So the only thing they can survive on the lot is what falls off the table. If they have chairs right here, they just don't know it. I called for them. Miss. Uh, happy Mother's Day again. Thank you, man. And uh, don't forget, tonight is canceled because of Mother's Day. And don't forget, Tuesday at 7, you said? 7 yes. o'clock. We're, we're SWAT training. All right. <laughs> SWAT training. Come on. Did you ever think it'd be a SWAT training? <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Father, what can we say to these things? Your grace is just too good to describe. But Lord, we'll try. And we thank you. We thank you for your, your, your 
your love that just overshadows us. We, we thank you that, that your presence never leaves us. We thank you that even though our, our condition can sometimes be really dirty and really ugly, it doesn't change who we are in you. And it's never an excuse to stay. You're always drawing us in in, a, in love. And we're not, not in condemnation. And I just thank you for your attitude toward us. That your attitude toward us is love and mercy and grace. So Father, I pray for everyone in the, under the sound of my voice who, who's sitting here, who's going to watch on YouTube and Facebook. Father, I declare in the name of Jesus that we get a revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit that we have a position in you that is not dependent on our condition. And Father, I declare in the name of Jesus that our condition began to match up who you say we are in the name of Jesus. Old habits, uh, strongholds are to be broken in Jesus' name. And I, I just declare freedom for us to step into who we are in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your many blessings. And bless every mother in the room, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.